Um, so welcome to this next talk in uh, the Banjit series on belly maps and Hurwitz spaces. Um, we're very pleased today to have with us Sam Schiavone, who's going to speak to us about belly maps, computation, and data. And Sam, uh, before we get started, is it okay with you if we record this talk and post it on YouTube? Yes, certainly. All right, take it away. Okay. Thanks, Drew, and um, thanks to Drew and Rachel for organizing this. It's great to be here and talk about belly maps. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about belly maps from the perspective of computation. Um, and also I'm going to show you some places where you can find belly data that people have computed. Okay, so the rough outline of the talk is that first I'll talk about some background. Um, I think I'll be uh, brief at some points since other speakers in this series have uh, sort of covered this material. Then I'll talk about various methods for computing belly maps. And finally, I'll um, show you some places where you can find belly data. OK, so let's start with background. All right, so um, this whole area of study really starts with Belly's theorem. So um, if you have a curve over Q bar, you can also consider it as a curve over C. And um, this is sort of an attractive category to people who are more maybe uh, differential geom geometric minded, um, because there's an equivalence of categories between uh, smooth projective curves over C and uh, compact connected Riemann surfaces. So one question that you might ask is, which, how do you characterize the image of this inclusion? So which curves over C arise as base changes of curves over Q bar? And um, Belli answered this question. So here's his famous theorem. So a smooth projective curve X over C can be defined over Q bar if and only if there exists a non-constant morphism of algebraic curves, phi from X to P1 over C, unramified outside zero, one, and infinity. So um, this is a really striking theorem because it sort of gives you a, a geometric characterization of this kind of arithmetic condition to being defined over Q bar. So um, we're going to call a map of this type a belly map. <clears throat> so just to reiterate, a belly map over C is a non-constant morphism of algebraic curves that is unramified outside zero, one, and infinity. Um, and so this is an example that I think John Voigt uh, used in his talk and I will use again. So here's a, uh, a Belly map from um, going from P1 to P1 given by this degree three polynomial. And let's see that this indeed is a Belly map. So if we compute uh, the derivative of phi, we have, we see that, uh, okay, so it vanishes at zero and minus one, which get mapped to um, zero and one respectively by phi. So this shows that phi is only ramified above zero, one and infinity. And if we want to sort of see the ramification type above each one of these points, we can look at how phi factors when we, um, so first, when we just look at phi itself. So here you can see it has the square factor, meaning that one of the points above zero has ramification index two. And if we look at the factorization of phi minus one, we again see that we have now this quadratic factor, meaning that there's also um, a point of ramification index two over one. And since uh, phi is a polynomial, then that means that it's totally ramified above infinity. Okay, and so here's a picture of this map. So uh, here you can see, you have, see we have these three sheets of the cover and two of them come together above zero and two of them come together above one. And I haven't shown infinity, but all three of the sheets would come together above infinity. Okay, so um, Grotendieck was really impressed by Belli's theorem, and he said, uh, never without a doubt was such a deep and disconcerting result proved in so few lines. So using this theorem, Grotendieck described a faithful action of the absolute Galois group of Q on the set of isomorphism classes of Belli maps. So, um, you know, this, the absolute Galois group of Q is arguably the, the most important group in algebraic number theory. So anything that you can use, any tool that you have to study it is really of um, immense importance. So our goal, our, our somewhat lofty goal, I guess, is to understand the absolute Galois group by studying this action that Grotendieck described. Um, and we're going to take a very computational explicit perspective. So we're going to actually try to compute equations for Belly maps in order to get a concrete view of this action. Okay, so um, I think John in his talk talked a little bit about the sort of different categories that are in um, that are equivalent to the category of belly maps, and uh, we're going to use this in an important way in our computational method. So um, I'm going to sort of talk about the different categories and how to move between them. 
So the, um, the various categories that we'll be interested in are the category of belly maps, that of transitive permutation triples, subgroups of triangle groups, des saint d'enfants, and uh, function field extensions. This is uh, one is maybe not so important, but for the function field enthusiasts in the room, I think it's uh, it's sort of a nice way to make things seem perhaps more like the case of number in algebraic number theory. <clears throat> okay, so let's introduce the characters in our big bijective picture. So a transitive permutation triple of degree D is a triple sigma of three permutations in SD, the symmetric group on D labels, whose product is the identity, and such that the, the subgroup that they generate is the transitive subgroup of SD. So for belly maps, there'll be a notion of equivalence that um, you know, when two belly maps are isomorphic, and there's a corresponding notion of equivalence for permutation triples. So two permutation triples, sigma and sigma prime, are called simultaneously conjugate if there exists a, um, a permutation rho in SD, such that rho conjugates each element of sigma prime into sigma. So that's what the simultaneous part is. There's one permutation that conjugates all three um, permutations in the triple to the other three permutations. So this is a really uh, nice combinatorial characterization of belly maps. It's something that um, you know, you can use computational group theoretic techniques to compute um, if you're trying to find, as we will see, an exhaustive list of value maps. Okay, um, so we can organize these permutation triples into passports. So a passport consists of the data of um, the data little g, big G, and lambda, where little g is a non negative integer, capital G is a transitive subgroup of SD. And lambda is a triple of three partitions of D. So a permutation triple belongs to a passport if these three conditions hold. So here, this, this equation might look a little strange, but really what it is is sort of a combinatorial version of um, Riemann Hurwitz formula. So basically, what it's saying is that uh, if we look at the belly map corresponding to this permutation triple, it will be defined on a curve of genus G. And its uh, ramification divisor will have sort of the, the multiplicities given by this triple of partitions. Okay, so this is sort of a Riemann Hurwitz condition. Um, next, we want we want uh, sigma to generate this group G, and finally, we want sigma to have the cycle type specified by these three partitions. So passports are important because um, it'll turn out that they're stable under the uh, Galois action. So it's going to provide us a way to try to put a bound on the degree of the number fields that our belly maps are defined over. <clears throat> okay, so the size of a passport is the number of permutation triples belonging to it up to simultaneous conjugacy. So the size will exactly be this bound that I just mentioned. Okay, so the um, next category that we're going to look at is that of triangle subgroups. So for three integers a, b, and c that are at least two, we define the triangle group to be the group given by this presentation. So it's generated by these, these three elements, delta a, b, and c, um, which have orders a, b, and c. And finally, whose product is, um, is the identity. So uh, really this group is generated, you, you can just omit the third generator if you like, it's just generated by the first two delta a and delta b um, due to this, this last relation. Okay, and so there's a nice geometric interpretation of this triangle group. So given um, these integers a, b, and c, we can draw a triangle with angles pi over a, pi over b, and pi over c. And um, depending on their value, that will either be a triangle that lives on naturally on the sphere in Euclidean space or in hyperbolic space. So here you can see we've drawn this triangle in um, the hyperbolic upper half plane. And we have also its uh, reflection across the um, imaginary axis. And we can now interpret this triangle group as the group of rotations around the vertices of this triangle. So here you can see the, if you take this triangle pair and rotate it around this vertex with angle pi over a, you get this triangle pair down here. And if you rotate around um, the vertex with angle pi over b, you get this funny looking triangle over here where the hyperbolic you know, metric has sort of stretched things out. 
So, okay, so the triangle group can either be given by this presentation or in this sort of more geometric form. And uh, for you know fans of Escher, this is sort of how you get these tessellations of hyperbolic space by, by triangles. Okay, so um, the next category is that of dessin d'enfant. So a dessin d'enfant, um, which is French for a child's drawing, is a finite graph D embedded in an oriented compact connected topological service X with the following properties. So the graph must be connected. It must be bicolored, meaning that each vertex is assigned either the color black or the color white in such a way that adjacent vertices have different colors. And finally, um, if we take the surface X and we cut out the dessin, we want to be left with finitely many connected components, each of which is homeomorphic to a disk. And these disks are called the faces of the dessin D. So um, the dessin really has to live on the right, um, the right topological surface. You know, you have to be, when you cut out the dessin, you can't be left with anything that still has non-trivial homology. <clears throat> Okay, so here's our big bijective picture. So relating these um, these different categories. So here in the middle we have dessin with the uh, the category of dessin with the edges, and these are in uh, correspondence with transitive permutation triples, um, living in SD. It's also in correspondence with index D triangle subgroups. So here we've taken um, a subgroup of the triangle group I defined before. Um, it's in bijection with Belly maps of degree D. And finally, like I said, you can give this function uh, theoretic characterization, function field theoretic characterization. So um, we can also consider the equivalent category of de degree D function field extensions of the um, field of rational functions in one variable. And okay, and th these fields must have discriminants supported only at zero, one, and infinity. Okay, so now we've sort of introduced um, all the players in our in our Belly play. So now we want to see sort of how they interact, how we can move between these different categories. So to start out with, let's um, let's go from Belly maps to permutation triples. So uh, to begin with, so what we're going to do is we're going to take P1 and we're going to throw out the three ramification values. And then we're going to look at um, the curve that phi is defined on and throw, throw out the fibers above these ramification values. And we'll call that set U. And we'll also fix a base point P in the codomain downstairs. So since we've thrown out these ramification, um, ramification values and their fibers, then the restriction of the belly map to this set U is a covering space. So that means that we can now apply you know, the theory of coverings and path lifting and all that. So um, note that the, the base, the codomain, has fundamental group that's generated by these three loops around zero, one, and infinity. And in fact, this is isomorphic to the free group on two generators, because you notice if you take the product of these three loops, you get something that's now contractible. So their, their product is the identity in the fundamental group. Okay, so um, like I said, now we can apply the theory of covering spaces. So the, um, the fundamental group of the codomain acts on the points in a fiber via path lifting. So uh, this, this means that you, know, you take one of these loops downstairs and now you look at the lift to the covering and it will somehow permute the, the points in the fiber above this space point. So this induces a homomorphism from the fundamental group of P1 minus three points to SD. And this map is called the monodromy representation of phi and its image is called the monodromy group. So the cycles of the permutations are uh, correspond to the points of X above zero, one and infinity and the length of the cycle corresponds to its ramification index. So let's look at an example to, um, to really understand this, our, our example from the beginning. So here, okay, we have our um, degree three belly map from P1 to P1. And if we look above, so if we think about a loop around this point zero in the codomain and we lift it to a path starting on this red sheet labeled one, if we now, follow this path, we're going to end up on sheet two. So that in this way, we get this transposition, one goes to two. And you can see from the picture that this point has ramification index two. And similarly for, um, if we take a loop around one, we exchange these two sheets. 
So the image of the three generators of our of the fundamental group of P1 um, minus three points give us our permutation triple. Okay, so now, so we went from belly maps to permutation triples, but really what we wanna do is go the other way. So we wanna start with this nice combinatorial data that we can easily compute and then um, find the associated belly maps. So we're going to go from permutation triples back to belly maps now, but via triangle subgroups. Okay, given a transitive permutation triple sigma in SD um, with orders A, B, and C, so sigma zero having order A, sigma one having order B, sigma infinity having order C, uh, let delta, um, which we'll take to be delta A, B, C, be the associated triangle subgroup. So this is the triangle subgroup, um, the triangle group defined by this presentation that I, I gave before. So then we have a group homomorphism from delta to SD that simply sends the generators um, to these permutations, sigma zero, one, and infinity. Um, that's, this homomorphism exists exactly because uh, by definition, a transitive, the product of a transitive permutation triple must be the identity, and, they, um, and these sigmas have the correct orders, the same orders as the deltas. <clears throat> okay, so how do we get our triangle subgroup now? Well, we take, um, we take it to be a stabilizer. So we're going to define gamma to be the stabilizer of one under the action that we get by um, via this homomorphism. So our triangle group now acts on one through D by acting as these sigmas. And we look at the stabilizer of, um, of one. And this gives us an index D subgroup of delta. Oh, and sorry, and here, here G is the subgroup generated by the um, permutation triple sigma. Okay, so we've made it halfway. We started from from permutation triples, and now we're um, in the category of triangle subgroups. So now we need to go from triangle groups, subgroups to belly maps. <clears throat> so let gamma be a subgroup of the triangle group delta. Then delta and gamma act on um, their associated geometric spaces H. So this is just the space where you can draw the triangle with angles um, pi over A, pi over B, and pi over C. So it's either the sphere, Euclidean space, or hyperbolic space. So if we look at the quotient of H under this action, um, so the quotient of H by delta is homeomorphic to a sphere. And after resolving quotient singularities, it's even we can even find an isomorphism to P1. So the Riemann sphere. <clears throat> um, similarly, if we look at the quotient of H by gamma, this can be given the structure of a smooth projective curve. And we have this natural map from H mod gamma to H mod delta that just takes a point modulo the action of gamma to the corresponding equivalence class modulo delta. So here's a picture um, to sort of uh, illustrate this. So over here, we have a fundamental domain for the action of delta on here, this is the hyperbolic disk. So you can see um, you know, the, the, the fundamental domain is just a triangle um, together with its mirror image. And you can see, so these labels on the, on the sides are supposed to tell you how to glue this together. So this T1 glues to T1, this T2 glues to T2. So you're left with this sort of dumpling looking thing with, um, which is homeomorphic to a sphere, but has these sort of three corners that we have to um, then blow up to get something smooth. Um, over here, we have a fundamental domain for the action of gamma on, on H. So you can see uh, in this case, we, have, we took an index seven subgroup of delta and you can make a fundamental domain just by taking the fundamental domain for delta and sort of shifting it around by a set of coset representatives for of um, delta mod gamma. <clears throat> okay, and so the map from H mod gamma to H mod delta is, is, um, is very simple once you have a picture like this. So given a point in the disk, you find its corresponding point in the fundamental domain for gamma. So you know maybe you land here in this uh, triangle pair labeled seven. And now the map going from to H mod delta is just putting it in the corresponding, um, putting it, moving it to the corresponding points in this triangle pair labeled one. So moving it over here, or really I should say over here, I guess. <clears throat> so given our triangle subgroup, we've now made a belly map, which is just given by um, looking at the map induced on these quotients. <clears throat> All right, so here's the summary of um, how you get around this bijective picture. So 
to get from Bellier maps to permutation triples, we just looked at the monodromy group, or maybe the monodromy representation, I should say. To get from permutation triples to triangle subgroups, we just took this, we considered that homomorphism took the stabilizer of the label one. And to get from triangle subgroups to Bellier maps, sort of completing the, the loop here, um, we just take the, uh, the map from H mod gamma to H mod delta. <clears throat> okay, and I guess I didn't really mention these last two categories, but uh, they're not quite as important to our computational, to our computational method. Um, but uh, given a Bellier map, one can define the dessin of the Bellier map as the inverse image of the closed unit, unit interval zero to one, where we label the points above zero with a white vertex and the points above one with a black vertex. And uh, in the usual uh, way of algebraic geometry, a, um, a morphism of curves induces a morphism of function fields. So we get a function field extension. Again, this is just for the, the function field enthusiasts. Okay. So um, here's an example, to sort of going back to our first example um, to illustrate this, this bijective picture. So here's the, the Bellium map that we, we looked at, so this um, cubic polynomial. And here's its descent. So if we take, if we take the image of, uh, if we take the closed unit interval and pull it back by this map, this is the picture we get. And you can see, so here's this point of ramification index two above zero, and here's the point of ramification index two above one. And then also, you know, you can see the, the points of ramification index one as well. <clears throat> okay, and if um, if we stared hard at that picture of the, you know, the, the sheets and the covering, we would see that this is the permutation triple corresponding to um, to this belly map. And uh, so the triangle group that we get, so these have orders two, two, and three. So we get the triangle group delta two, two, three. And um, this map gives us a index three subgroup of this triangle group. <clears throat> and finally, the extension of function fields corresponding to this Bellier map is the one given here. So you have, um, okay, if we call this polynomial T, we have this extension of function fields where we have C adjoint T um, extending to C adjoint X. So you can see this is a degree three extension of function fields. <clears throat> okay, so are there any questions at this point? Now that we've sort of moved around this big bijective picture. I think it looks great, Sam. Okay, well, I'll keep going then. <clears throat> okay, so um, now we're going to move more into the computational portion of the talk. So uh, Grotendieck was really enchanted by this theorem of Belli and was wondering if we could, you know, understand the absolute Galois group via, um, you know, its action on Belli maps or on dessin. Uh, Pierre Deligne was not quite so optimistic. So he said, uh, Grotendieck and his students developed a combinatorial description, maps of finite coverings of P1 minus three points. Um, it has not helped in understanding the Galois action. We have only a few examples of non-solvable coverings whose Galois conjugates have been computed. So maybe this isn't pe pessimism so much. Maybe it's just, uh, you know, sort of lamenting the state of affairs. So, well, we can try to fix this. We can try to compute more examples of non-solvable coverings and try to, you know, study their Galois conjugates and understand this action. <clears throat> so our goal is to sort of um, to compute a wide range of examples and you know, try to understand this action by studying them. <clears throat> okay, so um, in their paper on computing Bellier maps, Jeroen Seisling and John Voigt uh, give a survey of the various techniques used to compute Bellier maps. They roughly fall into three categories. So there's the what they call the direct method, which um, involves Grobner bases. There are piadic methods and there are um, complex analytic methods. I'm going to sort of focus on the first and the third because those are the ones that I know best, but um, maybe I'll make a remark about the piadic methods as well. <clears throat> so let's start with the direct method. So uh, suppose that we were, we have the passport, um, so zero, so it's a genus zero value map uh, given by uh, this triple of partitions, so two plus one, two plus one, and three um, with the monodromy group S3. <clears throat> 
So this is in fact the, the passport of this first example, this one that I've, I've been carrying along with us, this degree, this degree three polynomial. Um, but suppose that we didn't know what the equation of the Bellu map was to start with. And we were, we were just given this sort of combinatorial data of the partitions and, well, and, the, uh, and the monodromy group. <clears throat> So what we're going to try to do is just to compute the Bellu map using this, this information. So since the cycles of length 2, 2, and 3 are, are unique in their respective fibers above 0, 1, and infinity, that means that the corresponding points have to be fixed by the action of Galois, which means that they must be points defined over Q then. So um, this, this would not be the case. So for instance, if I had the partitions, you know, a, a partition of 4 where I had 2 plus 2, maybe these points are only defined over some quadratic extension of Q. And so I have to be a little bit more careful when I'm trying to normalize my, my uh, normalize the set of equations I'm setting up. <laughs> but in any case, in, for this example, we can apply an automorphism of P1 so that the corresponding points um, of these cycles of length two, two, and three are again, zero, one, and infinity. So we're going to insist that this is a dynamical value map in the um, terminology that Uslam defined in her talk. And uh, like I said, since, since these points must be defined over Q, that means that this automorphism will also be defined over Q, meaning that we won't be extending the field of definition of our value map. <clears throat> so with this normalization, then that means that the value map um, must be a degree three polynomial because um, it's totally ramified above infinity with, and we've taken that point to also be infinity itself. And um, it must have this form. So the fact that we've insisted that this two cycle is zero means that this quadratic factor must just be x squared. And now, um, since we've insisted that the, this two cycle above one is also one, we must have this quadratic factor when we subtract one from three. So we've sort of taken the factorization that you get from insisting that, um, that we have this, this ramification type above zero and one, and we set these two equations equal to each other, or these two forms equal to each other, I should say, to get an equation. So um, we must have that the value map is this form for some a, b, and c in q bar. And now all we do is we expand these equations and equate coefficients. So if we do that, we get a system of three equations and three unknowns given here. And this has the unique solution um, a equals three halves, b equals minus one half, and c equals minus two. Okay, so this, uh, this system wasn't too difficult, right? You know, we're just dealing with um, three equations and three unknowns, and they're, they're all pretty low degree. I think, you know, degree at most two. But in general, uh, you can get much more complicated systems of equations. So as the degree of the value map increases, <clears throat> you get more and more coefficients that you need to find, and correspondingly more and more um, equations in your system. Now, in general, you can try to just solve this system of polynomial equations using Grosvenor bases. Um, however, as, as I said, as the degree increases, this becomes less and less tractable because as anyone knows who's worked with, with Grosvenor bases before, the worst case, um, in the worst case, the algorithm runs in doubly exponential time. So, you know, if, if you have a degree 12 value map, you very well might not be able to solve um, solve the resulting system of equations that you get using Grosvenor bases, at least not on a standard machine running today. <clears throat> so the direct method um, works sort of for low degree maps and maybe maps that have some special structure, but this solving the system of equations is sort of a, a roadblock to it working in general. <clears throat> so in 2014, in a paper with um, Mike Klug, Mike Musty, the yes S is me, and uh, John Voigt, we presented a numerical method for calculating value maps. <clears throat> so our method took as, an in, as input a permutation triple sigma and gives as outputs um, equations for the corresponding curve X and the value map phi defined on X with this monodromy group um, generated by sigma. So here I'll give a rough overview of how this algorithm works, or how this method works, I should say. <clears throat> So in the first step, we form the triangle subgroup associated to sigma, and um, we compute what's, what's called its coset graph. So basically, we look at the, um, the action of delta on the cosets of delta mod gamma. And this has to is sort of a 
an alternative way of looking at the monodromy of, um, of the belly map. <clears throat> Next, we um, use a reduction algorithm for gamma and numerical linear algebra to compute numerical power series expansions of modular forms um, in SK of gamma for an appropriate weight K. So this was uh, really done by, um, well, I guess first I'll say, so for classical modular forms, this is uh, sort of, you know, everyone's bread and butter. We have um, Q expansions and we can, you know, look at how we can multiply Q expansions and do all sorts of algebra to understand modular forms by these, these Q or Fourier expansions. Unfortunately, in our case, the triangle subgroups that we get are co-compact, meaning there are no cusps. So we don't have Q expansions at our disposal. However, we can still compute Taylor series. There's still, you know, holomorphic functions defined on, um, defined on, the, on the hyperbolic disk or the hyperbolic upper half plane. So we can compute Taylor series and use them to use these, these Taylor series to, um, to do calculations. So this method was really um, first explained in a paper by John Voigt and John Willis, and also in um, Michael Klug's master's thesis, so the K and KMSV. <clears throat> okay. So once we have these modular forms, um, we're going to use them as you always do to embed our curve into projective space. So once we've embedded the curve in projective space, we want to find defining equations for, its, for the image of this map. So we use numerical linear algebra and Riemann rock to find polynomial relations among the series for F, these, these modular forms Fi, which yield equations for the curve X and for the map phi. <clears throat> And I guess I should emphasize, so in steps two and three, you see this word numerical. So we're really working with floating point complex numbers. We've sort of lost this, this like, you know, the arithmetic nature of the belly map. So we need to try to recover that. And that's what we do in step four. So um, given the sort of numerical output of steps two and three, we then normalize these equations for X and phi so that the coefficients are algebraic. Um, and we try to recognize these coefficients as elements of a number field K and basically, we do this using um, LLL. So we have we use this lattice reduction method to find um, algebraic numbers that are close to our complex floating point approximations. <clears throat> okay, and finally, so I, I slipped up for a moment and said algorithm. We don't have an algorithm. We have a numerical method because we haven't proved that it terminates, and we haven't um, found bounds on its running time either. However, in practice, maybe you don't care because at the end of the day, you can still check that the answers that we give are right. So we can verify that um, the map feed that we get has correct ramification. This can just be done in, in magma using um, techniques in computational algebraic geometry. And uh, we can also verify that as the correct monodromy, so the monodromy given by this permutation triple that we started with. <clears throat> so, um, this can be done in Sage Math using the Riemann surfaces package that was implemented by Nils Brown, Jeroen Seisling, and Alexandra Zotin. Okay, so um, any questions about the steps in this numerical method? So, does your method work for for any sort of triangle group that can come up? <laughs> um, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I'm usually taking A, B, and C to be finite. So, you know, things like the modular group would have, it can be thought of as a triangle group, you know, with, with two, three infinity. But um, I think our method, I've only, I think our method is restricted to finite A, B, and C. But are there other types of groups you were considering? Uh, yeah, no, that was, that was my question. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so far, we've looked at a, the direct method and our numerical method using complex analytic techniques. I should mention that, okay, I'll just make a comment about the piadic method. Um, it's not something that I know very well, but here, here's, my, here's my limited understanding of it. So basically, it's you start with um, the direct method, but then try to solve it over a finite field FP, and then try to lift your solutions via Hensel lifting to give you, um, you know, approximations to the piadic coefficients. 
it's really not that different in spirit um, in, in, it's sort of, you know, a middle ground between the two, because then I think the way that you uh, recognize these piadic numbers as algebraic numbers is pretty much the same using lattice reduction techniques, just as we do in our, our step four here. <clears throat> okay. So um, one very useful technique that, well, everyone is probably familiar with is Newton's method. And we can actually sort of combine our numerical method with the direct method use, using Newton's method. <clears throat> so basically solving a system of, of polynomial equations is hard if you are just trying to solve it algebraically using Grobner bases. But if you just want to solve it numerically and you have an initial approximation that's pretty good, you can do this without too much trouble. <clears throat> so here's sort of a regime um, for combining our numerical method with the direct method. So we start by computing, excuse me, a um, numerical approximation to our belly map using, using our method. Um, and we do this at lower moderate precision. And this gives us our starting vector. So we compute the system of polynomial equations from the direct method and then use this initial numerical um, approximation as our sort of starting vector. We then apply Newton iteration to obtain massive, massive gains in precision. So for instance, um, <clears throat> Here's a, pass, here's a genus zero passport with monodromy dromy group S8 with these three partitions. And it has size 28, meaning that um, the bound on, this, on the degree of the number field is 28. It could be less, but in this case, it turns out that this passport consists of just a single Galois orbit. So the belly map is really just defined over a um, number field of degree 28. <clears throat> so we start out by computing our, our um, initial numerical approximation to this map, probably it, I think we used 40 or 60 digits of precision, maybe 80. But in any case, using um, Newton iteration, we then can compute um, up to 26,000 digits of precision. And this is all done you know, within minutes. It's very quick, much faster than Grubner bases. And from there, we have enough digits of precision to recognize the coefficients of the corresponding belly map as elements of this degree 28 number field. So, you know. 28 is a pretty large degree of a number field, which is why we need all these digits of precision in order to recognize the coefficients. <clears throat> all right, so that's our um, that's my overview of the computational methods. Um, there are certainly many other papers that I've I haven't mentioned here, um, but uh, let's move on to data now. <clears throat> so. The first uh, database of belly maps that I ever saw, I think it maybe it was the first one, but I could be wrong, um, was that made by uh, Bechtrema, Perret, and Zvonkin. So they created a catalog of descent that are plane trees with at most eight edges and computed the corresponding belly maps. So um, the fact that their descent are plane trees means two things. One, so a tree, remember when you cut out the descent, you're supposed to be left with something that's homeomorphic to a disk. So that means that if your descent is a tree, it has to be drawn on the Riemann sphere. So these are genus zero belly maps. And what's more, um, since these graphs are trees, that means that the graph has only one face, meaning there's only one point above infinity. So the point above infinity must be totally ramified, which means that we can write the belly map as a polynomial. And um, they call these special types of polynomials Shabbat polynomials. Okay, and the fact that the, uh, the dessin have eight edges means, at most eight edges, means that um, the belly maps have degree at most eight. So they um, cataloged the data and computed the corresponding belly maps. And the, uh, their database is available at this URL. And let me show you a little, a little sample here. <clears throat> so here are the um, data and their catalog with at most, or, sorry, exactly five edges. And you can see they've computed the corresponding belly maps, which are these degree five polynomials. <clears throat> Okay, so this was the first um, sort of the first catalog of belly maps that I ever saw, and so this was very inspiring to try to you know extend their extend their computations further. Okay, in 2012, Arsene Elkin created a database um, of belly maps written in Magma. I think he was working with um, Samir Siksek. So it includes belly maps of degree up to eight. I'm not quite sure on the completeness, um, but his data is available at this GitHub link. 
And here's an example that um, he includes in his documentation. So here we're inside a magma session and he shows you, okay, he, there's some uh, conflict in the terminology of what is a passport. This, I think Oslem called this the combinatorial type of a belly map, which is um, what I would prefer since for me, a passport also can, um, contains the monodromy group. But here, so you can see, he tells you how many um, belly maps are in the database with a given passport. And you can, if he's computed the map, you can, um, you can pull it up using this command. <clears throat> So in this example, he has a belly map defined on a genus one curve given by this equation. Okay, and um, so in 2018, uh, Mike Musty, Yurun Seisling, John Voigt and I computed a, um, a database of belly maps, which we call BellyDB. This was in 2018. Um, and it was part of our, our paper for ANTS 13, um, which was published in 2019. So our data is available. Again, these are these are this was a computation done in Magma, and um, our data is available as, as a collection of text files at this GitHub link. Um, it's pretty big; it's about 1.7 gigabytes. Um, but you can still fork it and download it. And if you have Magma, you can um, then you know load our data into your Magma session and do whatever you like with them. However, if you don't want to, you know, go through the trouble of downloading and um, loading our data in, we also have uploaded this to the LMFDB. So uh, we, our, initial, um, our initial upload was done in 2018, but uh, I and other people have continued working on this um, since then, and it's an area of current development right now. So um, it's available at this link here. So it's the, at the beta version of the LMFDB. So this is you know, the hipster underground version of the, of the LMFDB. So, um, since this initial, this initial upload to the database, we've added many new features. So um, I'll just cover, I'll just list them here and then uh, show you in a minute on, on the site how it works. So we've uh, created links so you can download data from, from the LMFDB to your computer. We've made portraits, so there are pictures um, using these sort of similar to the, the pictures I had with these triangular fundamental domains. Um, one really nice thing about the LMFDB is that it sort of brings together um, data computed by many different people. So uh, whenever our belly maps were defined on curves that were already in the LMFDB, um, either elliptic curves or genus two curves, uh, we've provided links to these curves. So given a belly map, you can find the corresponding page for the curve that is defined on if it's in the LMFDB. We've added many search features. So for instance, if you're interested in looking at all belly maps defined over, you know, Q adjoined square root three, you can do that all the ones in our database anyway. Added many more statistics. And um, this past spring, I did a reading course with um, three MIT undergrads, Alexandra Hoey, Katie Gravel, and Ian LaMarta. And we studied primitivizations of belly maps, which um, if there's time, maybe I'll say a few words about. <clears throat> so uh, let me, well, okay. So th this is the, this is maybe the, um, yeah, let's just go and take a look at the website. Okay, so here's uh, beta.lmfdb.org with our slash belly. So here's our collection of belly maps. Um, so you can see that this database currently has 600 belly maps of degree up to nine. And if you're curious over on the sidebar, it'll tell you, um, you know, the completeness and reliability of our data. Um, so the database is complete up into including degree six. So here are some, um, yeah, so here are the search fields that you can you can search on. So for instance, if you want to know all the belly maps with uh, with uh, field of definition Q square root five, there you go, there they are. <clears throat> so here are just some examples that I thought were nice that I would show off. Um, oh yeah, and so here are the statistics. So you can look at the distribution of degrees of belly maps in, in our data, the distribution of Galois orbit size. So if you're interested in this Galois action, this is something that might be of, um, of note. Um, the distribution of genus, of passport sizes, and this one is um, also interesting for those interested in the Galois action. So the distribution of the number of orbits per passport. So you can see that the vast majority of these passports are irreducible. They have, they consist of just a single orbit, but there are quite a few that have more orbits. Okay, and here are some, uh, here are some more examples. So 
here's a degree six belly map with um, monodromy group given by this label. And uh, so here's the work that I did with, with um, these MIT undergrads. So, you know, the, the nice thing about the LMFTB is if you don't know what something is, you can usually just click on it and it will tell you. <laughs> so um, we call a belly map primitive if it's monodromy group is primitive as you know, it's action on, on um, one through D is primitive. And if the action is not primitive, that means that we get this intermediate cover. So we can decompose this belly map as a smaller belly map composed with some um, morphism of curves. And so in this case, um, this map is a lift of the degree two belly map, which is basically just X goes to X squared. <clears throat> okay, and so this was a genus zero belly map. So it's just defined on P1, which is maybe your favorite curve, but maybe also the most boring curve. So here's one defined on a, um, an elliptic curve. So again, we can see that this is a non-primitive belly map um, and it's defined on this curve here. And over here on the sidebar, you can see that this is a curve that's in the LMFDB. And so, okay, you can click on it and learn all about this elliptic curve if you like. <clears throat> all right, what other examples? So here's one defined over a pretty big number field. So degree six number fields, um, again, on an elliptic curve. This time, um, the elliptic curve isn't in the LMFDB, so there is no link to it. But uh, you can see our equations are getting a little bit a little bit messy. Okay, and down here you can see um, which permutation triples correspond to which embedding of this number field inside the complex numbers. <clears throat> All right, and I think I have one more. Uh, I'll skip this one for now. Okay, here's. Uh, here, here's, here's a great one. <laughs> so um, it's defined on this genus one curve um, over a degree 21 number field. And here's the equation. So this is an area that uh, of, of, current, of current work where we're trying to simplify our equations for, for our value maps. On the one hand, maybe you don't care though. If you just are interested in the Galois action, well, any equation will do, right? As long as it's in terms of these algebraic numbers, you can see what the Galois action is. But I think if you actually want to work with this belly map, it would be really good to get it in a nicer form. <clears throat> okay, so I have a couple minutes left. Uh, let me. Okay, so if that was uh, if that was the hipster version of of the LMFTB, here's the really underground version of the LMFTB. It's so underground, it's it's not even. Uh, maybe you shouldn't even be looking at it. So this is something that I've been working on. Um, it's currently hosted on this pinklmftb.org but hopefully it will be merged in pretty soon. So the main um, improvements I've made is adding even more maps. So we had um, in the current beta version, there are 600 um, Galois orbits of belly maps, but we had more data and I finally uploaded it. So now there's over a thousand Galois orbits of belly maps and over a thousand passports. Um, and Edgar Costa really helped me um, with writing the upload script for this and getting all the data in there. And second of all, um, if you're really interested in the Galois action, you want to, you really want to know about this correspondence between embeddings and belly maps and the dessin that that you get. So, um, all right, let's. So here's here's pink. So you can see more more maps, a thousand and eleven, uh, and the statistics have been updated. So here are, I think this is one that wasn't in there before. Here's one that definitely wasn't in there before. So AT50 is, uh, is one of the groups that we've added to our data. And again, um, so this is defined over a degree 28 number field. So this was the example that I mentioned where Newton's method was really invaluable. And so uh, now you can see, so this table of embeddings is now has links. So if you click on this, you get the embedded belly map, which has complex coefficients. And okay, they're, they're pretty horrendous right now, 10 to the 38, it's a pretty big number. Um, so hopefully once we improve our equations, these will also look a little bit better. But like I said, if you're really interested in, you know, understanding the correspondence between dessin and belly maps, you, you really need to understand that, you know, you really need to match the, the dessin with the embedded belly map. Okay, so, um, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for your attention and thanks again to the organizers.